All right, so I am here to talk about the outer dark. Um, uh, what I'm interested in, well here, let me start with the idea of what the outer dark is to me. Um, there is a pool of light that a lot of people explore. Um, this pool of light has been lit up by film and by radio and television, the internet, social media. These are places that a lot of people have explored uh, to a great extent, to a, a certain extent also uh, virtual reality. But right outside that light is something that's really interesting. It's the, it's the technologies and experiences that we haven't, haven't quite hit the mainstream yet. And that's what I'm gonna be here to talk about today. Um, because the fact is, we are all operating in a dark room. We are looking for a change of temperature to taste, taste a breeze somewhere so that we can find the wall, turn on the light switch, and hopefully know where the hell we're going. Now, uh, this talk is a highly abbreviated version of an hour-long discussion. I only have your beautiful faces for 23 minutes and 58 seconds. So, I'm gonna be skipping over a few things pretty quickly, but I'm introducing a lot of big ideas about how to improve your night vision. And then I'm gonna show a few examples of my experiments uh, to help sort of cast a light further outside. Um, as is being said, um, I am the executive creative director at The Mill. I run The Mill Experience Group globally uh, in LA, Chicago, New York, and London. And my job is dreaming up new things, uh, thinking about the intersections of art and technology, trying to prove out new techniques, new experiences, new tools and methods. And uh, but I'm gonna play an obligatory reel. It's only two minutes, you'll live. Um, <laughs> But uh, the reason why I'm showing it to you is I, you, I think it requires a little context before I show you a bunch of other things. This is what myself and my team work on. And it's just a smattering of work we've done over the last year. So uh, here's something rad, cut really fast with cool music. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, the team, uh, what we work on, we work, we, we dream and build technologically enabled experiences, whether it's an XR, responsive architecture, robotics, we've invented a car, um, we've done all kinds of really weird things, and like cool fashion shows, you know, stuff like that, video games. Uh, but like I said, at the heart of it is art and technology. It's okay to laugh. <laughs> it, I didn't put, up, put it up there to be serious. Um, so the, the, the mission of this group is, again, to define these new experiences um, through the combination of art and technology. Now, here is a term, a well-worn term these days, very shiny object term, emerging technology. Uh, and I actually want to start by saying that, um, by definition, emerging, te emerging technology is a relative term. Um, it is the combination of novel and or untested technologies to uh, defeat the status quo. And what that means is, is that what's emerging today is not necessarily emerging tomorrow. And I think it's used a lot, like, oh, yo, you used code and a projector, that's emerging, no, it's not. 
That's not emerging technology. Uh, so it's really about those novel combinations. And at, at its heart, um, emerging technology is about using the now to shape the next. We're, the, a lot of the tools that we use are, are extant tools. They're not emerging tools, but we're using them in really, really novel ways. And then occasionally we add some super science fiction crazy thing on the end of it uh, to make it the world's first ever blah, 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 into the blank. Uh, I just want to talk also a little bit, this is, a, this is like the super fast primer for futurists. Um, futurists look into the future and there are basically three loose categories for how one begins to work and or predict trends moving into the future. Uh, there is the probable, possible, and plausible worlds. Um, and they also, they kind of work with how distant uh, the technology or experience or cultural phenomenon is that you're talking about. Um, I want to be clear that the outer dark today is right outside the ring of light. It is the probable. It, are, it, are, it is basically I'm talking about things that we can safely assume will be true because all of the data points lead to it. Um, I want to, I'm going to consider this the fringe. Uh, out here is things like brain net and quantum tunneling and transhumanism. It's not the discussion today, but if you buy me a drink, I'll gladly rattle on about that. <laughs> One of my favorite topics, quantum tunneling. Uh, and then uh, few, uh, further, I, I also want to add this other layer to this, that um, there is a preferred future. And this is, this is because the future is not written yet. Despite what all futurists say and people and all the predictions, the thing is it's still probable. But it doesn't put enough action on people to help define and write that future. What is the preferred future? Are you waiting for the future to happen to you? I hope not. Uh, so a lot of people think that the, the future is defined by brands, governments, and technocrats. And to a large extent, they are. But I believe that the future should be, well, the future should be shaped more by artists. Um, artists, the job of an artist is to investigate the human condition, to think about beauty, to think about elegance, to think about, to try and make a more thoughtful world. Quite frankly, those first three do not share that same brief. Right? Obviously, they do not share that same brief. So what can an artist do to participate in shaping the preferred future? And I call these artists augmented artists. These are technologically enabled dreamers. They're using code. Um, they're mixing innovation design with futurism, with graphic design. They're a hybrid of futurist, technologist, and designer. And I believe that these are the folks that hold the keys to the future, a preferred future at least. Okay. so. Futurism 101, augmented artist concept laid down. Skipping way ahead. Um, I also, I, I'm gonna be talking about two technologies today. Uh, I typically talk about mixed reality as well, but there just isn't time. So the question is, how can these technologies change the art we make, our audience's experience, and perhaps our relationships to each other and our world? Well, to think about that and to say instead of, well, you just need to look at the technologies differently, that's absurd. Um, there's more to it than that. Um, the, the futurist and the artist has four different important steps. There's many, many more steps broken down underneath it, but we're just going to do the top four. Collection, connection, evaluation, and expression. Collection of data and stimuli, connecting it in a meaningful way, and evaluating what it means to you and to the world, and then expressing it bravely to be tested tested or experienced. So if you begin with collecting, um, the augmented artist uh, has to do something that futurists do, which is interrogating the vectors of change. And when I say that, I'm talking about innovation, consumer products, human behavior, social cues, culture, entertainment, dreams, fascinations, tools, market mediums, platforms, techniques, technologies, and then finding out how they start to mix together. And where you start to see these fascinating mix, uh, mixtures, these intersections, they start to paint a picture of what the future might look like and things that you want to experiment with and prove out. So, you know, for example, what might be really odd to you on its face without really reflecting on it is, why is it in Japan that there is a, a, an exponentially growing trend right now to, ha to have funeral services for robot pets? This is true. Now, what does that mean, right, as a designer? Well, you, you can begin to reflect on it. It's like, okay, our relationship with machines is changing. There's a sentimentality around it. We want to give the same sense of ceremony and ritual to a bag of silicon that we do to a bag of meat, right? That's a very cruel way to talk about humans, but, you know, <laughs> fuck it. 
Uh, <laughs> but that's interesting. So there's an exploration to, to, to take there. And the only reason why I know about that is because I'm constantly looking at all these different intersections. So uh, what do you do when you're looking at all those, those vectors of change? This guy said this, creativity is connecting things. Um, and say what you want about him, he was one of the great connectors. Very not nice guy, but <laughs> really good at connecting things. And his quote, this is excerpted from a quote that I want to read to you, it's great. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it, they just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. That's because they were able to connect experiences they've had and synthesize new things. And the reason they were able to do that was that they've had more experiences or they have thought more about their experiences than other people. Connect, reflect, right? So connecting is really about aggressive curiosity. And what, and what Steve was basically saying is good data in, good data out. But there's an in-between point where one has to reflect on that data to actually really understand if it's meaningful or not. We're not machines yet. Um, so we have to think about how those things connect to come up with better ideas. Uh, and then the last couple steps here is we're, we're, I'm really thinking about evaluation. Uh, intuition, uh, a lot of people say, oh yeah, this is gonna be big. Why do you think that's big? Um, why do you think this is the next big thing? Uh, a lot of people use intuition. It's like, yeah, I read it in a magazine. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, reading about things in the press means that it's already entered the mainstream. It is a little bit late. Um, and you're not saying anything new. So what kind of methodology can you apply to alleviate the speed wobbles of predictive futures? So um, I actually have a universal methodology. Uh, I typically teach it, um, but we don't have time today because we have to get to other sexy bits. Um, I will show you at the end of this talk how you can learn more about this. I call it the Geometry of Innovation Design Thinking. It is based on a series of tetrads. Tetrads are a collection of four questions that supply accurate answers, not right answers. Your job is to figure out whether the accurate answers can become right answers. It's a whole process, but it really helps you along. Whew, talking fast, so much to go through. Um, and then of course, the last step is express. Uh, you, it, besides doing this, a lot of people um, do a lot of deep thinking and prediction, but they don't fucking do anything with it, <laughs> right? What is all that worth if you don't take action upon your beliefs? So expressing bravely to create proofs for a preferred future. Okay, onward. Okay, let's talk about some actual um, experiments. I'm gonna start with biometrics, which is a personal fascination of mine. I've been creating artworks and proofs in, using biometrics for about 10 years. Um, it began uh, quite a long time ago um, when I was fascinated with trying to figure out what happens if a film knows you're in love? Uh, what happens when your car knows you're bored? Um, how would you change? How would the experience change? Um, trying to create this more intimate relationship between man and machine. Um, I start all my projects and my experiments with a series of observations. These are actually results of the tetrads I was talking about. So behavioral observation about humans. We use emojis an awful lot. Um, we do it because we're desperately trying to convey our emotions through an emotionless medium. A screen, a piece of glass, some pixels. Uh, second behavioral observation. We love responsive design. We love um, algorithms sort of predicting things for us. We like autofill and dynamic layouts. Um, these are interesting, but they're not really anticipators um, or indicators of true response. What happens when it really responds to you? Like it's listening. Ooh. Um, uh, third behavioral observation. We seek to improve ourselves through the quantified self. Just think about how many people here are wearing a wearable that measures their steps. I've already noticed this crowd doesn't like to raise its hands, but there's some there. Okay. So, Here's an interesting thing, like most of our wearables to measure our biometrics, we use them to count steps or altitude or whatever. And this is like listening to the human body, measuring the human body like you're checking the oil pressure on a vintage coupe. Um, yes, this is inf uh, interesting metrics, but it's not really meaningful as to who you are, how you move through the world and how you interact with technology. I just think this is hilarious. I've actually seen people do this. Like, oh yeah, man, I'm gonna get more steps, so I'm gonna run in place. All right, <clears throat> and then the last observation before I start getting into the cool stuff. Biometric sensors are getting a lot better. Um, the latency is coming down. The, the signal to noise ratio is much better. 
um, we're, we're, we have new technologies that exist that are able to listen to that data and respond. And it's moving very, very quickly. Think about how the environment is going to start responding to your biometric data. So this is, I, I make these observations, I write one sentence briefs for myself and my team. This is what we must prove. Create a responsive experience navigated by mental state that can improve our lives. Um, when we're thinking about the quantified self, I'm not interested in making people run faster. I'm interested in thinking about how can we be more in tune with how we feel, how we think, how we navigate the world. Um, this is actually a very old experiment. We built this five years ago, and we're still, we're still uh, adding on to it. Um, I'm just going to talk over a quick review of what it looks like. So Strata is very quiet. Can you guys turn it up a little bit? Um, it's a real-time virtual reality environment that listens to an array of sensors. None of these, this is all very old. Um, it's listening to your heart rate, your respiration, your galvanic skin response, your blood pressure, your body temperature, and your EEG, depending on what we're using. Or we use heart rate variability. The entire world responds to your body when you breathe, the ocean moves, and flowers, uh, flowers bend. Uh, everything that blinks is your heart rate. Combined with other signals and your EEG, we're listening to you to see if you're beginning to calm down and become more focused. As you do so, you begin to levitate. The only controller for this experience is your autonomic nervous system. What's interesting about this is if you use this on a repeated basis, you become more in tune with those signals and begin to control them. And controlling those signals allow you to achieve things like flow state or being present, to use a meditative term. Uh, right now, <clears throat> it's been updated considerably since we made this years ago, this video. Um, and it's being used, it's in clinical trials to help alleviate PTSD, to help autistic children, um, marriage counseling. It started out as a weird art project, but we realized that the principles of information coded biofeedback, that means I can see and or hear what my body is doing, are actually really powerful tools to help us begin to control ourselves. Cool? Cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you another quick biometric idea. Um, another um, observation I made was that, I mean, this is a little Orwellian, um, but how can we reveal the true desires of an individual? Um, I was uh, approached by a large hotel chain, and they were like, yo, whoa, we really like Strata. Can we do a biometric thing? And I was like, eh, I don't know, maybe. Um, but I thought about it, and what was interesting to me is that when I look at social media and how people respond to it, we perceive that we know what we want, but we're inundated by an enormous amount of stimuli. The pretty girl standing on the edge of a canyon with wind blowing her hair back, you know, might say, I want to be that girl, you know? Or maybe I don't. Maybe I want to be in an igloo alone. Maybe I want an urban experience. How can we start to uh, subvert um, the, the stimuli that we see and get back into what our heart truly desires? What is, what is it that I want? What is my body saying? Not what social media is telling me to like. So I responded to them with an Emily Dickinson quote and said, I'm going to prove this. We're going to build a large, large art installation. And <clears throat> this art installation is called Seeker. And it's an experience where people came in. Uh, we strapped them up with wireless biometrics, and we created an array of different stimuli, tactile, audio, gestural, interactive, um, and visual. And each station of stimuli is constantly measuring your biometrics. We're also making observations for linger um, and engagement. <clears throat> but based on these stimuli, they're categorized in certain ways where we're starting to figure out what actually speaks to the person without them knowing that they're making a conscious decision. In the end, it created a generative piece of artwork um, based on your emotional data and actually connected all these things to data points that belong to hundreds of properties all around the world and then gave you an answer. You know what? You'd really like New York City. You want to go to museums. <clears throat> you like the bustle. You like the temperature. You like modernism. And uh, so we ran a bunch of people through this. We also created a website. Um, unfortunately, it can't, of course, use all those advanced biometrics, but we're using principles of uh, psychological evaluation to arrive at these answers without you knowing what you're answering. Cool, right. So here's the thing that I'm trying to prove out. Um, and I can't show you all the biometric stuff, but I, I think it's really interesting because I think the future is not about using biometrics to measure our steps, but creating empathic intelligence. It's also called the emotional economy. This is when your environment, 
your electronics, your, your media experiences understand how you feel and respond appropriately. And this is, a, this is a big deal to crack for most brands or governments or companies. It obviously can be used in a very bad way, which I'll talk about at the very end. But I'm really interested in trying to eliminate the control surface between ourselves and our technology and coexist in a way, when I look at someone's face, I know how they feel and I respond appropriately. Uh, machines have a really hard time doing that right now. But, you know, I'd like my car to sing me a happy song when I'm feeling blue. All right, moving on. Artificial intelligence. Um, uh, it easily is the most transformative technology of our time. Um, but it's so breathlessly spoken about and, and, and captured that, uh, that people are starting to lose a, a, a point of view as to what is possible. Um, and it gets really, really confusing. So um, my observation. First and foremost, all artists through all of history have been defined by the technology they use to express their art. Um, from flint knives to 3D printing, it changes the kind of art and the way that we can express ourselves. I thought that was really interesting. Hmm. Observation two, uh, collaboration. I was a jazz musician for a long time. Um, dig the beard, bro. Uh, and, and what's interesting is I spent a lot of time improvising with strangers. And it requires trust. It's a high wire act of making art together in the moment. And that can only happen when you trust and respect the, the, the point of view and the skills and the artistry of the other individual you're working with. Oh, I thought, hmm, OK, that's true. So my question to the team, can we create a new kind of art by creating a new kind of technology that creates a new method of expression? Whoa, big ask. Um, so this is the resulting brief. Create an AI that wields the most human creative tool and demonstrates creative value through live collaborative improvisation. I would like to introduce you to the Replicator, which is a beatboxing artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm going to play you a quick case study. So what we did is um, we built this AI. We trained it on hundreds of thousands of pieces of music to be a wicked drummer. Uh, we taught it to listen to the human voice, to parse rhythms live, but also to perform live. And a friend of mine, uh, his name is Reeps One. He is a world championship beatboxer. And I was like, dude, we're going to go to South by Southwest. We're going to talk about the future of AI art. And you're going to do a concert live and perform and improvise music live on stage. And at the end, you're going to battle it. And he said, OK. So here's a quick cut down of, of how it worked. And the music you're hearing is actually a capture of that live performance on stage. Artistic collaboration is left to a partner, something that has its own creative value, using its own intelligence, its own insight, and its own inspirations. So the question is, can we collaborate with an AI? So we naturally thought a beatbox battle could help us test this. Uh, we created an AI to collaborate with the vocalist, Reeps One, resulting in a beatbox intelligence that improvises in a real-time duet and in a call and response battle of man versus machine. We decided to use a convolutional neural network to listen to it. It understands his voice and what sounds and beats he's making. So we used machine learning to train it in music, feeding it hip hop, R&B, and funk to know what beats are and how to improvise and compose music that would work with the beats that the artist is making. And then it performs. It uses a vocal sample bank built from Reeves' voice. And it does it all in real time. And the AI creates improvisational fuel for an artist, and the duet together creates something totally new. I have an other as a, an extension of me. The interactions are some of the best moments I've had as an artist. The future is really only limited by our imagination. OK, so it weird that we built a beatboxing AI, but I was trying to prove out several things. Can I listen to the human voice instead of taking uh, direct computer commands from uh, 
uh, MIDI keyboard. Um, can it actually do it in real time with no latency? It's not listening for very long and then it just streams and improvises constantly modulating its speed and its rhythms to match different styles from breakbeat to soul to hip hop, whatever. And, and can you write music with it like you would with a human? And so uh, Reaps is actually uh, currently working with the AI to make an album, which is cool. All right, I'm gonna speed up and I'm gonna go about three minutes over, just giving a heads up. Cool, cool, all right. Uh, so the truth is, is that we don't really have what's called general artificial intelligence. Not quite yet, we're on the edge of it. And general artificial intelligence is able to use many different kinds of inputs and or experiences as we call them as humans, and is actually able to learn and adjust. Right now, it, uh, artificial intelligence is very good at very specific skills it's trained on, like beatboxing. It's not gonna cook you eggs. It's not gonna talk, discuss philosophy with you. Um, but the truth is, is I prefer augmented intelligence. And in fact, every single person in this room right now is an augmented intelligence because you probably all have phones on you. And these phones are able to tell you about the weather in Egypt or summon a vehicle to the corner where you're standing at or tell you how to get somewhere or reveal some interesting truth. If you go back 10 years and you told somebody you could do that, they would call you a fucking wizard. <laughs> it's true. We lose perspective on what is happening with us right now and it's changing our behaviors and our abilities through technology. Really think about it, 10 years ago, yeah. Yo, this car's gonna be here in about two minutes, gonna pick us up, it actually knows our name and actually knows where we're going, dude. <laughs> Crazy, all right. Um, so furthermore, I believe in this uh, new term called augmented art. Uh, this is a term that I've developed uh, for our teams and I hopefully it becomes more popular. Trademark me. Um, but I believe that the output, um, when we're working with advanced intelligent technologies, the output of this is categorically different from all art humans have ever made since the dawn of time. And I say this because you don't collaborate with a flute or a paintbrush or point shoes, you wield them. What happens when the tool you're using you collaborate with, you partner with? It's a different technology and if art is defined by the technologies we use, we need a new label and we need to actually discuss what art means when a technology starts taking over or participating. Now the catch of this is that, um, it, can an AI be creative? Um, a lot of people argue back and forth about this. I, as of right now, absolutely not. Because an artificial intelligence requires an algorithm to translate its reality. There, is, there are rules. And if we don't understand the algorithm for creativity, nobody has really figured out how humans are creative, not down to a formula. And until we can do that, we cannot train our AIs to do so, so therefore they cannot be creative. So blah, 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 wrapping it up. Empathic machine intelligence. Um, uh, so I've shown you Strata, Seeker, and Replicator, Replicator. And it's interesting to think about what happens when those things begin to combine. When you have an artificial intelligence that's able to listen to your emotions and feelings and affect change on the environment around you. Now, the dystopian view is something like this shit show, which is terrible. And the reason why I show this is because every single person in here that works as an artist or is, is working with brands to create new experiences, you all have a responsibility to try and help work towards a preferred future. Do not pick low-hanging fruit. Do not make this bullshit. I will come and find you. There have to be safeguards. We have to be thoughtful about the things we make because it's not like making a commercial anymore or a video game. You are affecting change upon people's relationship to each other and the world when you're working this category. Question everything. Everything I just said might be total bullshit. I'm just up here saying my point of view might be wrong. Um, don't wait for brands, governments, and technocrats to define the future. Become an augmented artist. Investigate the human condition. Help participate in creating a preferred future. The future, again, has not been written yet. Help participate in writing it. And the truth is, again, I'm gonna say this again because it's important, we all have a responsibility. Everything we make now contributes to what, the, what tomorrow will look like. We have to be mindful of self, our relationships to each other, our relationships to media. Um, because, and, and as you move forward, this will help cast a light into that darkness. And you have to remember that today's outer dark is tomorrow's light. So everything you do now has great importance. URLs. I work at the mill. That's our Instagram channel. I have a really, really not well updated website. Um, I used to post to Instagram a lot. I don't anymore. I'll start again. 
Um, uh, when I was talking about the tetrads, the geometry of design thinking, I, um, if you go to miraculum.io, you can sign up for my quarterly newsletter where I make crazy predictions um, and discuss about what, what it means to be an upright mammal as we move further and further into the 21st century. And I usually use it um, by talking about art technology. Um, you can also join our team. We're always hiring. We have a serious problem with not being able to staff up fast enough. The world is coming fast. <laughs> So join the team, and thank you. <laughs>